Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about our low-cost portable OCT system that we're developing for the point-of-care use. Uh, as Julia mentioned, um, I'm Adam Wax. I'm primary at the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Duke University, uh, also a member of the Fitzpatrick Institute for Photonics. Um, my laboratory is called the BIOS Lab, which stands for Biomedical Interferometry, Optics, and Spectroscopy. Um, we have a range of topics uh, from early cancer detection, phase imaging, spectroscopy. Uh, today, we're going to focus on OCT and um, how we're advancing this uh, existing technology to make it more usable in the clinic. Uh, just a little background. I, I'm guessing if you tuned in to this talk, then you know a little bit about UN, uh, OCT at least. Um, OCT is the optical analog of ultrasound. So you send light into the tissue and you measure the backscattered reflections. And by noting the time of flight or how deep the light has penetrated, you can map out a three-dimensional tissue profile. I'm showing here a couple of examples. This is a OCT of a normal healthy retina. And you can see uh, various layers of the retina. And here's the fovea where your detailed vision occurs. And then on the right here, I'm showing an example of a diseased retina. And so you can see this macular hole developing. And this is a problem because when you get a hole in your retina, uh, you lose vision um, and it's very difficult to restore. In fact, almost impossible with the current medical technologies. Um, OCT has seen great use. So if you go to a, a you know, top uh, eye clinic and you have a, a retinal problem, they will probably do an OCT on you. But there's limited access in other parts of the world. And whether that's the developing world or, um, you know, just in more rural parts of uh, the developed world, it's um, just not available. It's an expensive instrument. They cost, you know, upwards of $35,000, um, but can cost easily sixty dollars to $100,000. Um, this cost makes it difficult to expand OCT to new clinical areas. So if you have an OCT machine, it's probably set up to image people's retina, and um, it's not easy to modify it to try other things with it. And so this has limited the spread of OCT, how widely it's used. So we believe that by making a much lower cost OCT system, we can really increase its uh, usage and uh, provide greater access to this technology. Um, so we developed our first low cost OCT a couple of years back. It cost about $7,000. And the way that we did it was to use high performance, low cost components from other fields. You know, for example, the uh, sensor in your iPhone for imaging is a very high um, quality uh, piece of technology, um, but it's so inexpensive because they make hundreds of millions of them. So if you're able to borrow some technology from a field that has high quality technology but low cost, then we can do the same thing for OCT. We coupled that with the idea of using 3D printed parts. So usually in scientific instruments, you machine all your parts out of metal and they have very high tolerances and they're you know, precision machined. Um, but we figured out a way to make OCT equipment out of 3D printed parts, which are um, lighter, uh, less costly, and uh, easier to make. This is our first system. Uh, we published on this in 2018. Uh, the cost was just around $7,000. Significantly, the weight was only six pounds. and I believe that's about three kilos, translating for the EU here. Um, if you look at it, it's about the size of a shoebox. That is a complete unit. It has a built-in PC, which is this uh, black square at the top. So all you need is a monitor, or you could actually use your cell phone or tablet to control it. Um, it has entry-level performance, meaning it matches the performance of most uh, entry-level OCT machines that are out there. If we look at some of the images, we can see that they are comparable to uh, you know, state-of-the-art OCT. These are examples of an ex vivo porcine eye. And here we can see the cornea and all the layers, the epithelium, the Bowman's layer, Decimens membrane, et cetera. Uh, and here we can see the closure angle, um, uh, which is important for diagnosing uh, glaucoma, for example. Uh, after this initial result, we wanted to make a system that was more useful uh, for clinical practice. So we designed our center, second generation system. Um, this one cost about $5,000 to create. Uh, here's a picture of it here. This one's even smaller than a shoebox. It's about this big. Um, you can see the integrated PC here in the top. And now we've included a touch screen right in the panel. So there's no need to use any other external device. You can plug this in just like a consumer PC, pick up the handheld scanner, and examine people with it. So uh, this one cost about $5,000. The weight was four pounds, which is about two kilos. Um, and with the uh, integrated PC, the handheld probe, 
this is a highly portable unit. You just pick it up, put it under your arm, go out and scan people in the field with it. So the question is, um, how's the performance? So we ran side by side with a Heidelberg engineering machine, um, showing the low cost images on the left and the Heidelberg engineering on the right. Um, you can see the Heidelberg's a little bit brighter, but all the features are visible. And um, in this bottom example, I'm showing diabetic macular edema, and the quality is certainly there to be able to make a diagnosis. When we uh, compare them side by side, we can see that we have fairly good performance compared to the Heidelberg. Uh, here are the stats for the Heidelberg. You can see um, all the key features right here. Um, for our system, costing about $5,000, 250 cubic inches. Um, sorry, I didn't translate that into um, uh, metric, but um, you can just see by order of magnitude that it's much smaller than the uh, Heidelberg engineering machine. So this instrument here is 656 cubic inches, but the full system is actually 3,700 cubic inches because you need a separate PC and a separate monitor. When you weigh it, the four components are 27.6 kilograms, that's 60 pounds, uh, compared to just four pounds or two kilograms for ours. And I think the best uh, differentiator is the fact that their instrument costs over $60,000. So how's the performance? Well, the Heidelberg is a little bit better than ours. Uh, when we look at the contrast to noise ratio, we can see that there's about uh, a 6% difference between them. So ours is 1.59, theirs is 1.68. Um, so the net difference is about 5%. Uh, but when you take into account the cost and the reduction in size, um, it's certainly a reasonable uh, trade-off to ha have. Um, I'm pleased to say that my startup company, Lumetica, offers low-cost OCT into the research market. Uh, here's an example of the uh, OQ Lab Scope, which is available for just $9,995. Um, we have distributors in Germany. Uh, Edmund Optics distributes it. And um, with advanced options now, it offers performance that will even exceed the Heidelberg. So for example, we can go up to 80 kilohertz. We can have improved resolution down to 2 micron axial. Uh, and we can do it at 840 nanometers or 1310 nanometers. Uh, we're working now on getting our uh, clinical system, the OQI scope. Um, it's not uh, approved for human use yet. We're working on that, uh, but it's available for research use and it's coming soon. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to some of the clinical applications that are enabled by using low cost OCT. These are things that you can do with OCT more easily if you have a low cost system that's easy to build. Um, I think the best feature about our technology is that we've introduced this agile design process. So in the past, if you wanted an OCT system, um, you had to design it from the ground up and again, making these precision metal parts to make a spectrometer, um, scanning mechanisms, uh, would be very expensive to design from scratch. On the other hand, our system uses a, a new design process that allows us to rapidly change image parameters, uh, imaging parameters uh, at the touch of a button. So we have this modular design where we can change uh, the grading um, or the lens tube uh, inside of our spectrometer to generate the performance we want. Um, here you can see the 3D printed plastic and we have a nice uh, ZMAX design showing the airy spot. And by simply adjusting which sensor you're using, which grading um, and which lenses, you can get any spectral range or uh, spectral resolution that you like, which are important parameters for OCT. Uh, one of the first projects that we uh, uh, developed with this was doing OCT through a bore scope. So um, if you wanted to use OCT for surgery, for example, it's not very easy to do. Certainly, you, you could not take apart a, um, a retinal imaging system and use it for surgery. You need a device that's fit for uh, surgical access. And uh, that's what we were trying to accomplish here. So we took a commercial rigid bore scope. This is commonly used for things like laparoscopy or you know, minimally invasive surgery. And we attach it to our OCT scanner here uh, using a simple 4F relay. And then uh, again, we use our custom printed parts to be able to attach it very easily. Uh, here you can see it attached to the system. Um, sometimes the 3D printed parts have interesting color. So we have this nice blue here. Um, and you can see the bore scope coming out. And um, it's nice because you can use it to measure things inside of the body through just a very small incision. Uh, you know, the axial resolution, lateral resolution were comparable to most um, OCT systems that were out there. And um, uh, you know, we were able to deliver more power of the sample than we did with retina, for example. Uh, for this study, what we wanted to measure was the thickness of the cartilage at the uh, femoral head. Uh, this was on a porcine femur, so big bones. 
And um, you can see here that we were able to measure the thickness fairly accurately, 400 microns. Um, currently, there's no way to measure the thickness of this uh, cartilage uh, intraoperatively. So you may go for knee surgery, for example, and they might measure this with MRI beforehand. But once you're inside of the body and once you're in the uh, surgical suite, um, it's very difficult to get an MRI or a CT scan there um, and, and quite costly. On the other hand, if you had a small handheld probe and you could measure 3D profiles of your tissue, it has the potential to impact a lot of areas. Uh, in this study, we measured the thickness of the cartilage at the femoral head and we came up with just the simple false color mapping scheme. So the thinner areas have uh, darker color and the thicker areas have lighter color. And you can see where this would be useful for a surgeon who may be trying to do a corrective uh, surgery. Uh, another area that we work in are, is uh, GI or gastrointestinal applications. Uh, we've had a longstanding interest in imaging the esophagus. Um, it's actually an area where there's uh, increased risk of uh, cancer um, in recent years. Uh, for this system, we used a 1300 nanometer OCT system, again, using our agile design process to change our grading and lenses and um, uh, imaging sensor to make an entirely new OCT system at a different wavelength. Uh, for this system, we used a rotary probe. So the probe is attached to a, a motor that spins it around. And this lets us insert it into the esophagus and image around uh, in a circle. Uh, for this system, we developed a novel probe for the tip, again, using 3D printing. So the optics um, look something like this, where we've got a single mode fiber, uh, a grin lens, and a prism that turns the beam so it looks out to the side. And this whole thing spins around. What we did was we posed this inside of a 3D printed um, scan head which is uh, shown here in cutaway. So you can see the probe right along here. The brown is the housing. And then we actually 3D printed a uh, flexible cuff that attaches to the endoscope uh, that lets us um, uh, easily uh, implement this for um, endoscopic applications. Um, with our rapid design process, we can quickly switch through different probe designs. So initially, we started out with uh, the dimensions shown here. But then after working with a physician, he said, well, I'd prefer if the window were slightly more towards the tip and the tip were more rounded. And so because we're using 3D printing, we were able to type that in and make that again. Before 3D printing, you would have had to, you know, created a whole new um, plastic prototype and it would have been very expensive and um, taken, you know, weeks. Uh, whereas here we're able to change it in just a few hours and get it back to our physician in just a few days. Um, with the final system that we went here, uh, we were able to incorporate another modality in there. Um, and uh, I really like how this, this uh, cuff here is uh, 3D printed. I mean, it's a flexible material and you can just print it on the 3D printer. So to show you some of our first examples, um, here's our first generation probe. You can see the tissue down here. It spins in 360, but we're only getting a view of the tissue here at the bottom. Uh, with the second generation probe, we have a lot reduced reflections, uh, much fewer reflections we're able to image the tissue much better. Um, when we zoom in and look at normal tissue, you can see the hallmarks of normal tissue in OCT, lots of nice flat layers. So this is the esophageal, esophageal epithelium. Um, when we look at Barrett's esophagus, which is a condition where glands develop, uh, we can see a real difference in the tissue. You can see these open voids, which are indicative of glands. Um, we have been working on a, um, a study a clinical study with this technology it was completed in February 2020. We're preparing the results for um, presentation. And we're about to begin another study where we do um, 40 patients, where we do a, a biopsy on that tissue, measure the uh, likelihood of precancer there. Okay, I'd like to switch to another area, uh, cervical epithelium. Um, cervical cancer is the most common gynecological cancer that's out there. Uh, the standard of care is to have a pap smear. But um, it's not a perfect technology. Uh, there's a time and a resource cost. So you know, if you live in a developing nation, it might be difficult to get a pap smear. Um, and there's also a limited specificity, meaning that there can be a lot of um, false positives. And this leads to a lot of um, anxiety for the patient. All right? So if you get a result that you have a positive pap smear, you have to go back in and get a biopsy. And um, it can be a long time before you find out the actual true results. Our approach is to use a new technique called Angle Resolved Low Coherence Interferometry, ALCI. Uh, it's a mouthful, and I'll explain it in a second. 
But the idea is that we're going to measure scattered light as a function of angle, so scattering angle. And this lets us determine the size of the scatterers. And here they are cell nuclei. One of the hallmarks of early stage cancer is an enlargement in the cell nuclei. So by measuring this enlargement, we can find precancerous lesions with high uh, sensitivity and good specificity. Um, we did a clinical study showing that we could detect uh, precancer or dysplasia in vivo. Um, but now I'm really gonna focus on how we use this agile design process to develop a probe for cervical cancer um, uh, detection. So another word on ALCI, um, the nuclear diameter can be a surrogate biomarker for dysplastic or precancerous change. So seeing an enlargement of a cell nucleus from eight to 10 microns up to you know, 12 to 15 microns can tell you that you've got the chance of a precancerous lesion develop. Um, usually OCT can't see these cell nuclei on its own. So we have to use this angular scattering to be able to determine it a little bit better. Uh, other techniques like confocal can see cell nuclei, but it has its limitations. So it doesn't penetrate deeply enough to see all the way through the epithelium. Um, very often you need a contrast agent. And then you don't get a quantitative number out. Someone's looking at these pictures and trying to decide if these nuclei are larger. So our technique offers the advantage that we can detect scattered light, determine the size of cell nuclei, and we can determine them as a function of depth in the tissue. So we can determine the nuclei at the top, but the ones that are most diagnostically valuable are the ones at the bottom of the epithelium, which is three or 400 microns beneath the surface. So takeaway, ALCI is light scattering, and it lets you measure depth resolved nuclear morphology. Uh, here's an example that we use to develop the um, uh, cervical epithelium probe. It's just a little cup-like shape here, and it's got different size scatterers in these four quadrants. Uh, here's just a simple picture of it. Uh, so what we did was we did a map of the light scattering at all of the points, and here's an OCT image showing the, the cross shape that we got in the middle. Um, when we look at the different points, you can see by looking at the angular scattering, so this is a, showing angular scattering on the vertical axis versus depth, and then this is just a cutaway of the angular scattering we can determine the size very accurately by looking at how many oscillations we get. So we can tell the eight micron from the 15 micron pretty easily. Um, for this, we had to develop a unique scanning requirement. So um, you know, here's the optical design, which would be interesting for folks who are studying optics. Uh, more interesting is that we're able to develop the probe using 3D printing. So um, we have this nice little device inside that lets us do the scanning again all 3D printed, we install the mirrors and lenses right inside. Uh, this is driven by a pulley with a, a little motor that turns it. And then here's the outer housing, which is able to access the um, cervix. When we look at the results, um, one cool thing is we put a camera in the front so you can visualize the cervix right up front. Here's an example of a, a cervix. You can see the cervical os right here. And then we have our OCT image of the os and we're able to get our size and refractive index of the cell nuclei. This is a healthy example, so it was all between eight and nine microns. Um, we completed a clinical study with our clinical partners in uh, New York City. Uh, we did patients undergoing colposcopy, and um, uh, we have a manuscript in preparation on that. Uh, I'd like to tell you about all the different results that we've used ALCI for. This is a technique that I've been developing for 20 years. You can see in the early 2000s, we were doing mostly animal studies. Um, Right around 2010, uh, we switched over to doing esophagus. Uh, we had a very nice study with uh, over 300 patients, uh, 300 biopsy sites in the esophagus that was published in the medical journal Gastroenterology. Um, after that, we moved to other sites. We did a study in colon, but most recently we've been working in cervix. So um, we did ex vivo, so this was uh, you know, surgical specimens. But in the past few years, we've been doing in vivo cervical um, cancer detection. Our first paper came out in the International Journal of Cancer in 2018, showing 97% 100 um, sensitivity, 97% specificity. And um, we more recently moved on to a prospective study, meaning that we used our results from a previous study to predict whether a patient had cancer, and again, got very good results. Uh, this one's in preparation, and I hope it'll be out um, in the journals in uh, just a couple months. The takeaway here is that our human tissue studies consistently produce a negative predictive value near 100%. What does this mean? That means that if our device says this point has no cancer, then there is 97 to 100% chance that there is no cancer there. As a doctor, this is exactly what you want in a diagnostic, right? So if you're looking at a piece of tissue and you want to scan it and you're trying to figure out where to take a biopsy, 
If you do a measurement here and our device says there's no cancer there, then you have 100% confidence that there's no cancer there and you're justified in not taking a biopsy there. So as a means to search for cancer, this is a very effective device. And that's why we've been developing it for places like esophagus, colon, uh, and cervix. Okay, I told you about the light scattering because I wanted to tell you about our most recent results, which are very exciting for detecting Alzheimer's disease. So um, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease, um, which is characterized by, among other things, the, uh, uh, the amyloid beta plaques that appear. Um, you probably know it, uh, symptoms include a loss of memory and um, cognitive decline. Uh, so if we had a way to detect Alzheimer's disease, uh, it would be really valuable in the clinic because right now the only way they can do it is either by um, you know, interview, so you talk with a person, figure it out, um, not very uh, black and white, actually very subjective. Um, you can detect it if you do a combination of uh, PET and MRI or PET and CT, but that's about, you know, two to five thousand dollars in diagnostic costs so really you can't apply that to the general population to look for alzheimer's disease on the other hand how can you improve outcomes in alzheimer's disease unless you know someone has it so a very important part in developing new therapeutics is having an effective diagnostic a way to detect if a patient has alzheimer's and to detect it early enough where if you try an intervention whether that's a drug or a behavioral therapy to assess whether or not that there's going to be a change. You know, if you go to the point that someone's really far along the path of Alzheimer's, uh, a drug may not be effective. So you need a way to be able to detect it non-invasively and simply. And that was our goal in this project. Uh, so the idea here is we're gonna measure features of the retina to determine if there's any signs of Alzheimer's disease in the patient. What's the connection? Well, the retina is the only place in the body where neural tissue is actually exposed to uh, to light. And so by measuring the retina, you're actually interrogating the brain tissue, uh, neural tissue, and you can have an insight into a person's neural health. Uh, so our approach um, is shown here. This is an optical schematic, uh, maybe a, a lot if you're not um, familiar with optics. But I'd like to point out that we have two modalities here. So we have our OCT scanner, which comes in with the blue light, and then we're using our ALCI, or light scattering, to measure the other features of the retina. So it's coming in through this system here, both of them are combined at this mirror and imaged onto the back of the eye. In this study, we're looking at uh, mouse eyes, and um, here you can see an ordinary OCT of uh, the mouse eyes. So here's the, um, the optic nerve head. We have the nerve fiber layer, the outer plexiform layer, and the RP. I've just labeled a few of them here to keep the diagram more simple. Um, so we would take our OCT images, but then we would also take our ALCI me measurements at each point. Uh, ALCI will measure about 400 microns, so a section about this big. Um, and we did that at eight points across the retina. On the right here, I'm showing what a typical ALCI scan from the retina might look like. So we have a certain angular range, uh, plus or minus 10 degrees in the lateral direction, and about 30 degrees in the vertical direction. Uh, this red spot here is just the reflection. So when you come in with light, you get a reflection that comes off. We're gonna block that out when we do our analysis. What we're interested in is the texture. So this um, scattering pattern that we see uh, everywhere else in the retina and what it can tell us about um, uh, neural health. Uh, here's our processing pipeline that lets us um, analyze our angular scattering. So we take our uh, light scatter and we block out that um, specular reflection. Uh, we do a Fourier transform to get a correlation length. So um, these two are Fourier transform pairs. So we're actually getting the correlation length inside of the sample. And then we plot that as a function of length. And you can see different uh, patterns here. Uh, in addition, um, we do a pixel count. So we put a mask on top of that. We measure how many pixels are bright, how many pixels are dark, and what this de detailed histogram looks like. Um, and from that, we calculate additional metrics. Uh, here's our h and &E of our um, mouse retina. So we did this triple transgenic Alzheimer's uh, mouse model. This is a, a well-known model that's um, widely used for studying Alzheimer's disease. Um, you can see from the images that they're histologically the same. You really can't tell the difference just by looking at them. But if you use an, uh, uh, a stain that's uh, keyed against um, amyloid beta, you can see that uh, in this um, 
triple transgenic mouse, we have a prevalence of uh, amyloid plaques, whereas we see almost none here in the wild type. Uh, first off, um, when we use OCT to image the retina, we were able to confirm results uh, that were seen before. So people have seen a thinning of the nerve fiber layer with OCT. It's been done in mouse before and been done in uh, human patients before, uh, but we were able to confirm that. We saw a decrease from about 18 microns down to just north of 16 microns, and there was a statistically significant difference there. So that's good. That means that our model is valid and we can see what other folks have seen. What's new here is that we were able to see changes due in, in the light scattering patterns. So here what I'm showing is the short range correlation slope. And I'll give you a physical interpretation of that in a minute. But basically, um, when we have this increased slope, right? So increased slope means it's steeper. That means that our correlation function is dying off more quickly. And thus we have a more disordered um, median. In this case, we see a disorder in the nerve fiber layer. So um, we have a much more, uh, a more disordered layer for uh, uh, the Alzheimer's mice, statistically significant. And here we really see a big change in the OPL, the outer plexiform layer with all those nuclei. And it persists all the way to the RPE. Um, I'll give you a physical interpretation of this in just a second. But we also saw changes in the amount of light scattering and the variance in the light scattering. So when we look at the mean intensity, how much light is scattered from the nerve fiber layer? This is important because if you just look at light scattered from the retina, it all comes back at once. But because we've got depth resolution, we can determine how much light is scattered just from the surface, the nerve fiber layer. And what we see is that the Alzheimer's mice have an increase in scattering and in mean intensity compared to the wild type. What's also interesting is we saw a much bigger variation or a variance in that light scattering. I mean, we saw more lights and more dark, so varying a lot more. And this was highly statistically significant. Um, what this means is that we're probably seeing a rougher surface. So if we look at different correlation functions, and I borrowed this um, from a colleague off on the internet, um, what I'm showing here is what happens if we increase the correlation function slope. So in an ordinary healthy nerve fiber layer, for example, we may see some changes, um, but it looks fairly smooth. But on the other hand, when we see an increase in the correlation function slope, so we're having a, a more disordered sample, we can see more of a sort of clumped grainy appearance. And that's kind of what we're seeing here in the nerve fiber layer. Uh, we're working now to try and validate these in, uh, in humans. Uh, so to sum up, I've shown you our low-cost OCT. Our integrated system design lets us maintain performance uh, while reducing the form factor. Uh, we completed our first clinical study showing that OCT, our low-cost OCT, approaches the performance of commercial versions. So instead of having to spend $60,000, it's now available at the $10,000 price point. Um, a cool thing about our technology is that because it's so um, versatile, we can change our system rapidly to meet lots of different clinical needs. So for example, I showed you how we use it in gynecology, gastroenterology, orthopedics, and neurology. And my hope is that this low cost, very lightweight, portable OCT machine will be widely used by uh, lots of people throughout the field. Um, just to sum up with, um, you know, thanks to all my members in my group. Uh, you know, Ji Song has been instrumental in some of the stuff that we've shown here. Uh, Evan Jelly, uh, I did show Wesley Kendall's uh, results, even though his name's not bolded here. Um, and then I did have um, uh, some PhD students who contributed recently, uh, Zach, Derek, sang uh, who moved on to other things. Uh, of course, our clinical collaborators and our funding sources. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>